giving his presentation in a second. And he's going to talk about the energy analytics for smart grids and flexibility management. Thank you, Ricardo. Do you want this one or the standard? Yeah, this one. Okay, perfect. Good morning. Um, so this is the first presentation of Intergrid on this session. There will be a second one. I know center more on the energy analytics side of the project. Um, and I will talk about time series forecasting, load and renewable generation, low voltage state estimation, flexibility estimation in industrial processes, and low voltage prosumer flexibility. And then in the, I will end with some challenges uh, for these areas. So these are all the, the all results from this European project, Integrate, um, that we are starting to demonstrate them in the field. So. Um, on energy time series forecasting, so this is a project on smart grid, so we want to forecast the load uh, and the consumption on the distribution grid and also on the clients on that grid uh, and also renewable energy. Um, so one thing we are doing is that we are not looking at the statistical models, so most of the improvement we are having it's by creating new features out of the raw data, so we are doing some kind of feature engineering um, and we are for example using local and spatial features for renewable generation, uh, temperature based features for load forecasting uh, and also selected some important variables for low voltage consumption uh, forecasting. So um, I think one key result from the project is that we can actually get a lot of improvement by just working the input data set you have and not focus too much on the statistical models. Um, and that it's a key uh, result from the project. Another one is that we try to apply deep learning. So when there was very nice results, uh, some promising results, but in the end we found, okay, we were happy, but in the end we found, okay, it's true this picture. So um, actually it only works if you have a lot of data, which is not always the case uh, on real problems on when we, have, we need to have demos in a real world network. And, you have a lack of data. So this works very well theoretically uh, when you have a lot of data. When you go to the field, you don't have so much data and the data quality is not so good. Um, so this more, more sophisticated approaches doesn't work so well. Um, anyway, we try to apply these on, uh, on the consumption time series uh, mainly. Uh, and we are able to improve uh, by improving these models, uh, the consumption on the median low voltage uh, substations. And that's where we are mainly work, uh, forecasting the load on these substations. And then we use the power flow to, to have the load on high voltage and median voltage uh, substations. Um, just for, uh, as a reference, we are decreasing compared to a basic model around 20% improving the, the forecast error of the, of the load. Another problem, and that's it's a limitation we have on the low voltage grid, is state estimation. So um, when we go to the traditional approaches, you have observability issues. So smart meters, they collect all the data, but they only provide you one time per day, usually in the end of the day. So it's, it's a critical limitation. If you want to know exactly the operating conditions of the network in real time, that's the, the main barrier. You have low redundancy, so if one smart meter fails, you don't have that measurement. And numerical instability, because either you don't have the network topology, or you have it, but you have a lot of gross errors when they do the field work to uh, map the topology and to know the parameters of the lines, there is a lot of gross errors. So the information to run the power flow, it's not always available. Um, and then we want to have real-time monitoring of the grid, and this is not possible uh, to have for the full uh, low-voltage uh, grid. So what we are doing in Integrid is to explore the information you collect from the advanced metering infrastructure. So you have smart meters in all the low-voltage clients. You collect some real-time information from the few smart meters, and then you have one time per day, you get the full uh, data from all the grid, but not on real-time. Um, what is the motivation and we are applying a data-driven approach, uh, why? Uh, because if you look at the voltage on the low voltage node, this is one example you have here, uh, you, you see a seasonal pattern. So there is in fact a periodic cycle for the voltage that repeats every day uh, and every week. 
Um, another one is that if you correlate the voltage uh, in the same grid in two different nodes, you see a lot of correlation between them. So in fact, if you have two nodes, if you measure one, you can estimate the second node from that one. Um, and these are the two main ideas for us to apply a data-driven uh, approach. And this is real data from the real low voltage network in, uh, in Portugal. So, and this is a scheme um, for the idea we have. So this is a low voltage network. You want to know a voltage in every node of that network every 15 minutes uh, or every minute if you have measurements every minute. Uh, you cannot have for all the nodes, it's impossible. Uh, the amount of information is high, the communication cost is also high, um, and it's even from the technological point of view, only with GPRS you can actually have this, and you have missing values even if you can achieve this. So what we have is in green, we have a few meters, 10%, uh, land 10% of the meters with real-time communication, and then with the state estimator, you can guess the voltage on the blue uh, meters in real time, just with information from the green ones. And that's what we, we are doing in the field and testing this. Um, the concept, it's quite simple. Um, just to show you an idea is we want to make estimation for the present and you have the last update. So from the previous day, the, the metering, active power and voltage from the previous day, and we want to know now what is happening on the low voltage grid, mainly the voltage values on the nodes. Uh, and you have the voltage from the past, historical data. So we construct a set of explanatory variables, um, measurements from the meters, a few meters on real time, um, weather predictions or weather measurements if available, uh, historical data, and data collected from the substation. Um, and what we do is that we go to the past and you ask for and you analyze if you have similar situations in the past. You give a weight based on similarity. Then you go back and you combine everything and you estimate the voltage on that specific moment based on past uh, historical data. So that's what we have done. We also included uncertainty because since you don't have all the information, you have uncertainty of what is happening right now. So the estimation, it's a point estimation, and then a the certainty interval, if you want to have probabilistic alarms of voltage problems, for example. And we compare with a, an approach we have developed in a previous project, Evolve DSO. The project was an FP7 project, and we are able to improve uh, the accuracy of the estimation with a very high improvement rate. Um, and this is the best approach we have so far that we are testing on, uh, on Integrate. There is some challenges in terms of field implementation that we are addressing as well in Integrate. Uh, what you see there, it's a distribution transformer controller. is a solution from the smart grid in Portugal, uh, promoted by EDP. It's from the Portuguese company, FASEC. They also have a stand here. Um, and th this algorithm, it's embedded on this controller on the secondary substation, so median voltage, low voltage substation. And it's connecting and receiving data from the smart meters. Some meters have GPRS, others don't have. Um, so some challenges, and one thing we are sure is that this is feasible with GPRS in some meters, if you have GPRS. Um, it gives situational awareness to the operator, and we are integrating with General Electric in the project, this in a heat map, where the operator can see a map with the voltage um, and with a heat for the, if the voltage is close to the maximum limit or to the minimum limit. What we don't know yet, and this is what we'll, we expect to get from the field tests, it's the performance with PLC Prime instead of GPRS. We'll test in the network where there is no GPRS, only PLC Prime and then memory issues. Because if you want to integrate these on, um, on this distribution transformer controller, it's an industrial computer. So in terms of memory, there is a constraint on it. And we need to see if the algorithm actually can work there or not without any, any issues in terms of memory. OK, so now going to the industrial uh, modeling of industrial flexibility, also a data-driven approach. Uh, we have in the project a wastewater company, and there, there is a lot of flexibility on wastewater. Uh, the issue is how you model it uh, from data, and how you represent it uh, from data to an operator, to a distribution system operator. 
Um, the representation we have is this one. So what you give to the operator, it's a very simple information. It's how much you can cut and for how much time. And then he can decide, okay, I will cut 60 kilowatts for uh, 40 minutes, or I will cut more, 100, for example, for 30 minutes. Uh, or he can increase, and you have the same information to increase the load. And this is the, ev everyone can understand this information independently from the process that is being modeled by, by the project or by the modeler. In our case, we are doing this for a wastewater pumping station. Uh, it's uh, 500 uh, kilowatts, so it's quite interesting for a DSO. Um, and what we do is that we have a predictive approach, so we try to guess, uh, considering the flexibility we request, either to increase or decrease the pump operating point. Um, we have a data-driven model to guess how the reservoir is increasing the level of the wastewater or decreasing the level of the wastewater. And then we have a minimum and a maximum level for it. So it's like a storage device, in, in fact, or a virtual uh, battery. Uh, at, at some point, you see that it's not possible. You reach the limit. So it means that you have a limit for this flexibility. And this is also related with, uh, with the time. So what we do is that we, we have a data-driven model that it's estimating this for, uh, for time and power. So for 20 kilowatt, we know we can go down 25 minutes of, for reducing these 20 kilowatts. After that, we reach the maximum limit of the reservoir. So we do this, we build a table for this, and in the end, what you get to the, to the operator is only that information on the, on the plot. This is for a real case study in, uh, in the integrated project for a wastewater station. And what you have on the top is exactly uh, the flexibility of this wastewater station. An operator here, you can see that I can cut uh, 200 kilowatts to decrease it uh, for less than 10 minutes. Uh, if this is an emergency situation where he needs to shed some load, this is a very important information and he knows for how much time he have the flexibility. So that's the concept we are exploring in Integrid uh, to have to give to human operators information about uh, flexibility for industrial uh, processes for um, domestic consumers are the next slides and it's a little bit different uh, from this, this approach. So on domestic consumers, uh, what we are doing in the project, it's an home energy management system. It also comes from the previous project we had, uh, Anyplace project. Uh, so it's a combination of hardware and software. Uh, in the project we are in fact developing hardware um, and software communicate with EV charging and storage, domestic storage, behind the meter uh, storage. And we are doing software uh, to keep data private behind the meter and also to communicate this flexibility to a higher level where it can be an aggregator, a retailer, or even a DSO if, if necessary. Um, so we started in the project by in having forecast as an input and we created something that it's quite interesting, is a flexibility trajectory. So we, what you have there, you know exactly, in this case, for 10 hours, how much you can request to, the, to that domestic consumer, and how you can adjust the profile. So every trajectory you have there is a change in this load profile for 10 hours. Um, and that is a very valuable information because it gives you information for multiple periods. Um, so what we are doing, and we first started with a very complex mathematical approach, and in the end we represent this flexibility by equation, was not very interesting even to communicate the flexibility. So then we move it to a dynamic uh, virtual battery, and this is, you transform a client into a virtual battery, a domestic consumer into a virtual battery, where the state of charge and the maximum power change with hour of the, with hour of the day, for example. And this is a very easy way to communicate the uncertainty, the flexibility, to include forecast uncertainty, and to keep data private. So you don't tell nothing about the domestic consumer. The domestic consumer is a battery. You know nothing about him. And this is very important because of privacy issues we have with the domestic consumers. OK, and this is a, like creating a business model to sell flexibility to, the, um, to a retailer, for example. So to conclude my, my presentation, some challenges that we are trying also to address in Integrid that are very important, but they are also beyond the, the project. 
uh, scalability, and this is an issue. Uh, one of the barriers on smart grids are scalability. So we do nice pilots on a small scale. When we need to go to a national scale, this is when the problems start. Uh, business cases, we actually need business cases for some of the tools and software you develop and hardware. Forecasting is one example. How, how you sell this idea to end users like DSOs is something we are doing in the project. We have a work package just for business cases. Data quality, it's, it's an issue. The quality in general is, is quite low. You have a lot of missing values. Stochastic methods, you saw the state estimator we have. It's a stochastic model. It gives uncertainty. Information, it's very important when you have renewable generation. Domain knowledge, so as you saw, we are applying data-driven techniques, but the background we have is power systems. So we know exactly the problem, how we need to solve it, and we know the classical techniques from, the, from power systems. And we cannot detach that from the... Oops, we cannot detach that from, that from, the, from data analytics. And the data privacy, this is the main barrier and the project is very focused on domestic consumers and GDPR, it's something, it's an opportunity, but we need to explore very well this, uh, this opportunity. And that's all from my side, thank you. Thank you, Ricardo, for that great presentation. Uh, my question is whether the audience wants to address some words to Ricardo. Do you have a question about his talk? Great, we have one. If you have uh, what we call it, almost uh, all the data you have and all the calculation for the forecasting, any uh, what we call it, risk of margin that you have to consider to keep uh, the system into the, in the stable issue. Thank you. Okay, you mean the, the forecasting system to be stable with all the data? Yeah, one issue is scalability. If we want to forecast the load in the full distribution grid, we are talking about hundreds of thousands of time series at the same time. Uh, it's not feasible. Uh, even with the new advances in the cloud computing, quantum computing, it's very, very ambitious. So we cannot aim to forecast every time series on a distribution grid. It's not feasible. Even if you have all the data from that grid. So we need probably to cluster the grid and some parts of the grid will benefit from forecasting and others doesn't need forecasting. And we need to have a more intelligent approach to, s to make some kind of segmentation of these new tools by type of grid and resources you have on the grid. That's something, but not on this project, we're not addressing that at least for now. Okay, so that's good to hear. It means machines are not going to make all decisions for us, but we are still somewhat needed. Yeah. That's it's a, you need to have a human in the loop uh, approach. Uh, when we have these tools like optimal power flow and we are integrating these with General Electric, in the end, the human operators, they are the ones to decide if the tool is good, if they can use it or not. And we need to integrate their requirements. Otherwise, it will, it will not work for sure. Okay. Hi, Ricardo, thank you. Um, I had a question about your first slide, actually, which I think where you sort of showed your um, your results. Uh, you mentioned there that your approach of adding more variables worked pretty well, except for the data quality issue. And I was just wondering what data quality issue you're actually referring to there. Is it a lack of consumption data from the smart meters or something else? Well, on the deep learning approach, you have two, two limitations. One, you need to have more than one year of data for that time series, at least, to extract some value out of it. That was the first problem. Um, no, it's not always available. Uh, you need to have the meter there measuring on the substation. It's not the case in several DSOs in Europe. Another one is that you have a lot of missing values and gross errors. And if you don't filter them very well, it will contaminate these complex models. So a linear regression, it's simple, but it's very stable and it handles that very well. Non-linear models, uh, you are more exposed to gross errors, missing data, and so on. So that's, uh, if you want to put something work on the real environment, we should start with something very simple. That's my advice. Thanks. Okay, thanks question. Ricardo. One last and I hope short question.
Yes, I, I will make it short. Uh, do you see a, any country uh, or any DSO in the world today or in Europe which is uh, willing to put some value on this uh, flexibility from, uh, 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 from consumers, from uh, households consumers? Yeah, there is cases in Belgium, they already use it. Uh, in Portugal, we are starting a pilot for one megawatt flexibility for industrial consumers, for both DSO and DSO. So I would say currently some European projects already are have that. Belgium and France are two examples. Uh, in the future, this is a, it's a trend that will happen for sure. But we'll need to start with pilots. That's not. Okay, thank you, Ricardo. Um, as an next speaker, I may then uh, announce Mr. Chad Cohen to you, who's the chief uh, data scientist of the project uh, PICA. Right. I'll try to handle all the new technology at once and see how I do. Um, I'm coming to you from the Energy Institute, which is located just an hour away by train in Linz, Austria. We're a research institute um, focusing solely on energy issues. Uh, we work on a lot of European level projects in new technologies and new ideas uh, for the energy transition, primarily uh, in the realm of consumer, consumer engagement and socio and economic analysis. So we're very interested in expanding our horizons um, with any of you that, that may have interest in such things. Uh, today I'm going to present our project PCAP, which is the Personal Energy Administration Kiosk Application. Um, I am the chief data scientist for this uh, project, which is a European Commission level project uh, funded by Horizon 2020. And actually our fantastic host for this morning, Johannes Reichel, is the coordinator of the project. So I might end up uh, forwarding some of the questions you guys have to him if I think he'd be better at answering them. <clears throat> so PCAP is two things. It's actually a phone application, a smartphone application that we developed in this project. And it's also the name of the uh, Horizon 2020 project. So facts about the project are that it has 10 partners. Uh, it's been running for about three years, so we're now towards the end of it, where we're actually analyzing the data um, and getting ready to show um, final results to the public. Uh, it was funded for about uh, 2 million euros, um, and it has partners across seven countries. Um, and the interesting thing about this uh, app that we developed in this project is that it uh, interfaces with the smart meters and is, uh, enables the, the consumers to um, interface with their data, learn about their energy consumption, and also um, what's sort of innovative here is that we're also forwarding spot market prices and in some cases price discounts that are defined by the energy provider to the consumers um, to help with grid balancing and uh, other initiatives as well. Um, so as a part of this project, we did a field test that has um, over um, 2,000 users across four different countries, um, and that is the data that we are looking into now. So the motivation for the project is essentially as a way to use smart meter data. Um, under the EU directive, 80% of consumers are going to be equipped with smart meters by the year 2020, and we want to figure out how we can get consumers to interface with this data and use it in a meaningful way. Um, a phone app is uh, sort of an obvious way to do that, and we are one scientific project that is investigating phone apps um, with the caveats that I, I mentioned earlier. <clears throat> um, the objectives of the project are really threefold. Um, from the end user side, we're interested in getting people to interface with their smart meter data, allowing them to see and use their energy consumption data um, in an easy format. Uh, it includes things like games, it includes things like peer-to-peer -peer comparisons, um, and a lot of different experiments that are within the app that uh, we're testing in this project. And then, of course, the big one is forwarding them cheaper prices so that they can actually try to save money on their energy consumption. The key thing here is that this was without any additional hardware, um, as when you have a smart meter, all you need is a smartphone, which is the only requirement. You can download this app for free, and you can immediately begin um, your, your personal energy transition. Um, from the utility provider side, 
Um, we're looking to create a service that you can offer to your customers and create a competitive advantage. Uh, this is one of the first solutions that's market ready for forwarding um, spot market prices or cheaper electricity or electricity discounts um, that could be due to renewables in the grid, for instance, um, f directly for your consumers and also as a way to, to interact with your consumers uh, in a positive fashion. And we found some really good results um, on that side. <clears throat> From our perspective as a research institute, we're interested in the effect on behavioral change. So does an app actually work? Will people actually use it? Are they interested in it? What parts are they interested in? Does it get them to change their energy consumption? And what sort of ener uh, energy consumption factor changes can we actually expect from such an app? <clears throat> and then uh, from the, also from the project side, we're interested in removing any barriers to market uptake. So this is actually a market ready product. Uh, the expected impact are on energy efficiency, also monetary savings from the household. We want to have a way to use the smart data infrastructure and reduce energy consumption, possibly. Uh, the PCAP itself gives all the information at a glance that a user would need. It's very user friendly. Um, it's a very easy to use app, which is part of the, the design here that uses the, the top of the line in socio and economic research and how people will interact with a phone app. Uh, it has built-in functions to foster energy savings. It also has a game aspect, and it has notifications that can be used to send discounted electricity prices, as well as other information that the utility company or provider might want to forward to their customer. I think I have a video for you that I will let play to explain the functions of the Peak app better than I could do. See here the PCAP is forwarding discounts to people that they will receive as a pop-up on their phone and then they're able to change their energy consumption in response to this. Also able to look at their billing information, consumption information, etc. So by looking at your consumption information, you're also able to detect these deviations. If something strange is maybe happening or if your consumption's changed for some reason, this app will notify you of that so you can try to figure out what's going on. This is a benchmark here that we call a peer-to-peer -peer effect or peer comparison, which is something out of the socio sociology literature that people might be interested in seeing how other similar households are using energy and where they compare as a way to uh, incentivize them to change their own behavior. And finally, there is a fantastic game as part of the PCAP we call Peak Poker. So this user is betting on their electricity consumption for that day. And then they're able to try to figure out through the app which appliances they're turning on and off that are using electricity for them. So to really understand at the appliance level what your electricity consumption is, uh, is all about.
It's also integrated with social media, which is another way to enhance these peer-to-peer -peer effects. People want to show changes in their energy consumption uh, to their friends. All right, so now that that very catchy song has woken everyone up, including me, um, let's move on uh, and talk a little bit about the results that we've seen in PCAP. Um, so what that just showed you is all the functionalities that are in the app, and embedded in each one of those functionalities is essentially a socio or economic experiment, and we're trying to figure out which of these actually work and which one would be in sort of an ideal app. Um, so you saw most of those, but just to go over them again, uh, storing smart meter consumption data and showing it to the consumer, uh, forwarding dynamic electricity price or discounts that can be defined uh, by the provider as a way to balance the grid, uh, providing energy saving tips, um, interfacing with social media and using peer-to-peer -peer effects, um, and allowing uh, inter interaction with the energy provider and the electricity market, also including a game uh, in there as well. So we tested this in four countries, as I mentioned before. Each country has a slightly different field test um, in terms of the specifics. Uh, what I'm going to talk about today is primarily from the Austrian field test, as this is what we currently have most of the data for. Um, so there's over 1,500 uh, recruited users for the PCAP. You can see here the experimental design. So of these 1,500 people, 33% of them are what we call the control group. They actually didn't get the app at all. We just used them as a benchmark to see if maybe electricity consumption over time is changing among these Austrian households. 33% um, of them are in the app group only, which means that they have the app and they can use it, but they're not getting any discounted electricity prices. And then the third group has the full package. They have the app, and then they're also getting uh, discounted electricity prices, which is sort of uh, probably the, main, the, the biggest innovation in this app. Um, so that's the Austrian case. We also have three other countries represented, Estonia, Latvia, and Sweden. Um, and then in, in the case of these uh, countries, the users are getting uh, prices from the Nord Pool spot market instead of uh, defined discounts that are coming from the electricity provider. Um, so in terms of the benchmark, this is our first peer-to-peer uh, -peer interaction. Uh, this guy is telling people um, how they're placing in terms of other households and how they compare to other households that are similar to them. It has an intrinsic approval disapproval norm, uh, something from our psychology colleagues. Uh, it's updated on a monthly basis. We saw over 11,000 benchmark views from our about 500 users over the year-long duration of the app. So people are actually looking at it. And based on the first analysis that we have seen here, there is a negative relationship between benchmark views and energy consumption. So regardless of what your benchmark is telling you, looking at this and comparing yourself with other people is actually causing people to think about their energy consumption a little bit more and reduce it is our preliminary results when it comes to the benchmark. So of the users that we have here, um, in terms of app usage frequency, people are looking at the app about once or twice per week. 43% um, of them are just looking at the dashboard, which is their consumption information and their, their overview, basically. 16% of them are going deeper into the analysis. 12% of them are playing the game. And then 5% of them are seeing the benchmark. In terms of app usage, this is something that is actually important for these apps, as most apps very quickly uh, lose the interest of the people that are using them. Uh, what we see from Peak App, um, just to explain this graph really quick, Actually, uh, the dark green on top are the people that just have the app without the, uh, the discount prices. And the light green on the bottom are the people that have the app, and then they're also receiving the discount prices. And what we see is that after week 16, where we see that big spike, which is because we got another cohort of people downloading the app um, in the experiments, um, once everybody's in the field test, we see a rather slow, but uh, very slow, and then steadying off decline in app usage. So we end up with about 20%, uh, I believe, of people still, still using the app today, uh, which is actually a, a very high retention rate. The average app that's out there is about a 10% retention rate. Um, so we think that we are doing a decent job in terms of that. And after PCAP, we also did a, a post-project post um, survey 
And so this comes from that, and we're asking people what PCAP actually made them do from their perspective. 40% um, of users are claiming to be paying more attention to the energy use in their household. 22% uh, have changed their cooking or washing behavior. 14% have replaced inefficient energy appliances. <clears throat> um, the analysis page is the most useful to them, which is the one that's talking to them about their own energy consumption. 82% um, of users would recommend PCAP, and 90% would like to continue using PCAP or a similar app. Um, so these are the results in very short, um, as sort of a teaser. Uh, these are also preliminary, I should say, since we're still collecting the, the very final data. But first off, we see the dynamic electricity prices and the discounts that we're forwarding to people um, from the energy provider are actually increasing consumption in the time when there is a cheaper price, right? So people are responding to a price incentive. And this, it's important to note, has no home automation involved, right? A lot of projects that are working on this want to link it directly with uh, an, automated, an automated system that might turn on a, a washing machine, turn on uh, an air conditioner, et cetera. This is just people responding on their own and uh, changing their consumption through their own actions. <clears throat> and the second point, which is rather important for utilities and energy providers, is that the people who are receiving the discounts and have the app are, re are reducing their churn rate by 33%. So that means less customers are leaving the company. Um, and we think this is due to customer engagement, which as you saw from the last slide, people are interested in the app and generally using it. The next point is that households, household comparisons, so the peer-to-peer -peer effects are actually increasing um, energy efficiency, um, which is a contribution to the energy efficiency directive, which is another way that this can be used um, from the utility perspective. And finally, the last point is that we have confirmed the potential for peak load shifting and decreasing infrastructure expense via either discounts that will balance the load. And then we also did another experiment where we gave people uh, free power for a couple days if they reduce their power use at a certain time the days preceding that. So that's another way to reduce peak load. And that actually worked rather well, too. Um, so we see a lot of potential here and basically positive results across the board. In terms of the project achievements, we were listed as a finalist for the EU Sustainable Energy Award, um, which was awarded in 2018 by the EU Commission. Um, we were named as an example EU Innovation Potential Project in the uh, European Commission brochure, which is the eight out of 9,000 candidate projects that were selected. Um, and then we will also be presenting, I believe Johannes will be there at the EU Set Plan Conference in November 2018, so we'd be happy to see you there and we'll probably have uh, more in-depth results. Um, the, the session that we'll be at is called Citizens Are Asking For and Investing in the Energy Transition, How Can Research and Innovation Answer? Um, finally, if you were sufficiently teased by the results I just showed, uh, we're actually doing a PCAP event tomorrow um, to share more of those results, uh, not only from my perspective as a data analyst, but also the um, developers of PCAP, Green Pocket, will be there to discuss uh, the development side of it, and also the uh, energy company that uh, used PCAP will be there discussing how a utility can use it and what results they saw. Um, that's tomorrow. Um, right down the street at Stuve Restaurant. It starts at 10 a.m. and goes till 12.30. Uh, we're very happy to have all of you. You're really invited. Uh, we have some flyers that I'll, I'll walk around and give out after this. And we do have lunch included. Um, you can see more details at peakapp.eu. So that's all I have for you today. Uh, I would welcome any questions. So thank you, Chad, for the presentation. I guess there could be the one or the other question. I see one, one hand is raising. I have to change the side of the room. Hi, thank you for a very good presentation. My name is Hannah. Uh, I was wondering about the gamification part. If you've thought about any kind of reward systems that would uh, engage the users even more. Uh, that's a good point. Um, I'm not aware of anyone who's given like monetary rewards for the game. Uh, what we had is we had like a point system and they could earn points and then basically brag about them on Facebook is my understanding of it. Um, but there was no like real uh, monetary or, or physical reward that people got. But that would obviously increase engagement and it's definitely something that, that could be licked into further. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. 
Uh, yeah, you're absolutely right that there should be some kind of reward for earning a lot of points in that game, and that would be one of our next stages that we plan to implement into this app. Thank you very much for this fruitful pr presentation. Uh, my name is Ardan from uh, Turkey. Uh, I just would like to ask you that uh, normally uh, once once you want to uh, monitor the, all the consumption, you just plug into the smart meter itself. But as I can see from your presentation that you are connecting to the, all the nodes inside the home. So uh, what sort of a device, device that you are using uh, to connect and monitor all the nodes uh, in the houses? Oh yeah, so sorry if I, if I uh misinterpreted that. So th there's actually, we're actually only connecting the smart meter. We actually, we're not connecting to the other nodes. Um, we're, we are uh, asking people how they change their behavior afterwards, and they're telling us if they change the use of their drying machine or change the use of their cooking and washing. So that's actually just from a survey. We don't get data on that. Um, and so there's no aspect of the app that connects directly to specific appliances. It's just smart meter data coming through. Okay, thank you. So if you have any more questions, then I would really be happy if you could approach Chad in the break um, to stay within uh, the time frame of this session. So as the next presenters, uh, I'm happy to announce Mr. Brian Finkel and AJ Gambier from Analog Devices, a name that made me curious because I found that their products are pretty digital native. But um, let's see what they can tell us about how Accuracy of smart meters can be approved or tested at least. Do I need to wear the headset? Oh, sorry. We don't need that or we need, we need it? Keep your mic. Yeah, please. Sorry. Turn it on. Can you sit here or you want to just. That's all we need to do. That's what you should work for already. Take a seat here to wait on the stand or seat here. However you prefer, I think it's let's let me turn it on. And now you should that's that's what it was this one. Okay, just testing. Testing. You can see the screen on that side. Okay, thank you. We're going to talk about two field trials that our company is doing, one in Finland and one in Tunisia. But before we start, I'm going to say a few words about analog devices. We are a global semiconductor company, uh, 15,000 employees, and we've been delivering solutions to uh, smart metering for over 15 years. In fact, if you go back in the last 15 years, we've delivered solutions to uh, power more than 500 million smart meters. So smart metering is not new to us, but the Mshore technology that we're gonna talk about is new. So I'm just gonna give you a brief overview and then we'll go through the uh, field trials. So what is Mshore? So it turns out every electricity meter has a measurement function that measures energy. Okay, it has a, a function that's typically done by an integrated circuit that measures the current and the voltage channels. Okay, it's an important function because it's used to calculate energy consumption, which turns into billing information, so it needs to be accurate. And it also is used to, um, for, th for things to manage the smart grid. Mshore is a new feature within that e energy measurement function. It's a diagnostic system that continuously monitors the current and the voltage sensors in that meter. So think of it as a sensor for the sensors. The data is passed by a diagnostic system uh, compressed into what we call Emsher reports, right? And those are sent over the AMI network, either hourly or daily, depending on how the utility wants to configure them. They're passed to an analytics service, 
that's called Energy Analytics Studio. And that analytics service delivers insights to utilities on meter health or monitoring the accuracy of your meter population, as well as revenue protection or detecting tampers across your meter population. So this is a brand new capability that we're, we're introducing and we're doing the two field trials to prove out the technology. So why is meter accuracy important? Well, as you may know, meter accuracy um, drifts over time, and that's why meters are replaced you know, every 8, 12, 15 years, depending on the specific country, regulation, specific utility. And the only way to measure accuracy today is to do a field test, take the device out of the field, send it to a test lab, and measure it. And it's expensive and it's intrusive to consumers. So now with the Emsure technology, you have a way of monitoring the accuracy of each of your meters in the field. So now let's talk about the field trials. The first one is in Helsinki with a company called Helen, who's the DSO with about 400,000 subscribers, and also a meter solution provider called IDON, which is also located in Finland. The goal of the field trial was to validate Emshore in a real world environment. We've done lots and lots of lab testing, but we wanted to take it out in the field in real world conditions with real loads, with you know real weather, and test it out in the field. The other objective was to kind of prove our analytics technology, which will launch commercially next year. Field trial is one year, two phases, started in August. The first phase is complete. The second, year, the second phase will go to next summer. And we're also gonna simulate aging of that sensor. Obviously one year is not enough to simulate you know, 10 years of lifetime. So we're gonna do some special things to uh, sort of artificially age the meter um, and test out the analytics in that environment. Uh, we also used an independent test lab, uh, VTT Mikas, very well known in Finland. Uh, they do a lot of calibration and they're well recognized. So the independent less test lab um, sort of to validate the results of the, uh, the field trial. We used 40 devices installed in the field and they're installed as secondary meters. So they're not being used as billing meters, they're being installed in series with the primary meter. So why Finland? Okay, it turns out Finland is one of the countries with the highest electricity consumption per person. So the, the electricity bills are high and accuracy matters. Um, also, Finland is embarking on their second wave of smart meter deployment and they're looking for innovative technologies to make that deployment more efficient and more effective. And then customer trust is really important in Finland. It's important that the DSOs have trust from their subscribers. So making sure the bills are accurate is of uh, paramount importance. So here are some pictures of the meters. Uh, some installed in residential environments, some installed in commercial buildings. Uh, we wanted to get a variety out there. And yes, those meters in the top right are installed sideways. We had to get uh, pretty creative in finding ways to install them in uh, existing uh, cabinetry. So here's how we monitored the accuracy of the meters. The top graph uh, represents monitoring of an accurate meter. If you look at the y-axis, that represents the percentage drift of that meter's accuracy from its initial calibration. The horizontal axis, specifically the green line, represents the history of the accuracy over time. And as you'd expect, this meter looks pretty accurate. There's some drift there, plus or minus zero, but it's pretty much on target and well within um, the defined um, sort of uh, specifications of the meter, which can be changed with that orange line. Uh, so that's sort of the, uh, the upper and the lower limit. So you might have a class two meter, class 0.5 meter. In this case, we're simulating a class 0.5 meter. The bottom graph represents a meter that we artificially aged, okay? So we, we implemented uh, resistance across the sensor to simulate aging that might happen during you know, weather conditions or 
Um, in this case, an event like an electric uh, lightning strike. Um, so you see one event at the beginning of the field trial, one event sort of in mid-August, and this meter is definitely showing up as outside of its accuracy limits. So our goal for phase one was to have 80% of the meters, our measurement with our analytics, be within 0.25% of the measurement from VTT. We, we took 20 of the 40 meters, we uninstalled them, we sent them over to VTT, they tested them, and their test results are represented by the blue vertical curve. So you can see it's a very tight distribution around zero. That's what you'd expect for accurate meters. The red represents our analytic service and what we measured those meters at. And as you can see, it's, it's a little looser, but it's still pretty tight um, around zero. In fact, for each of the 20 meters, our analytic service measured the accuracy within 0.1% of the VTT drift measurement. So we were pretty happy about that, that exceeded our results. Now let's take a look at um, artificially aging the sensor. So this is kind of a life of meter number 3026. It was uh, tested in early August, pretty much accurate. It was installed by Helen in the field in Helsinki. And then we started measuring it with our analytic service and we monitored it at approximately zero. Some drift, but not much. We took it out of the field in early October. We retested it at VTT. It was still accurate. Then we did something special. So VTT applied a sensor over the shunt, which is the, uh, the, the electricity measurement function to artificially age the meter, then retested it. And as you can see, it came out to about minus 0.2%. So out of accuracy, um, it's actually minus 1.91%. That meter was reinstalled exactly in the same place in the field. We started monitoring it with our analytic service, and our analytic service measured minus 1.96%. So we were pretty happy about that result, um, pretty close to uh, the tested accuracy. So what's next? So we published a case study uh, based on this phase one of the field trial that's available in our exhibit booth. For phase two, we're gonna leave the 20 devices in the field and continue to measure them and monitor them for a year. And we're gonna take the 20 devices that we uh, took out of the field and we're gonna put them in the oven and do accelerated aging testing to measure up to 10 years of uh, lifetime. Um, and lastly, we are developing a meter accuracy monitoring spec, which can be used by meter companies or utilities in their requirements, if they want to add meter accuracy to, uh, to the, the requirements for the meter. So that's the Finland field trial. I'm now going to pass it over to my colleague, Ajay Gambier, who's going to take you through the second field trial. Thank you, Brian. Um, so, yeah. So the next uh, field trial which we are going to talk about is it's like I'm taking you from the cold uh, Nordic weather to the warmer uh, North African coast. Uh, so this is a utility uh, called STEC in Tunisia, uh, which is going for the smart metering deployment in 2020, late 2020. And one of the biggest challenges they have, uh, which they want to sort it out in this especially uh, upcoming deployment, is to reduce their losses. And one of the big losses which is coming from the electricity theft uh, on the meter tampering. And when we spoke to them about the Amshur technology that it can detect uh, difficult tampers uh, before going for any deployment, any utility, their priority is to evaluate the technology. And this is their goal of to evaluate through this field trial that if Amshur technology can uh, detect all these kind of tampers. And from the analog de devices perspective, uh, we are launching our analytic service in mid of next year, and we wanted to prove out our analytic service. Also, uh, you know, we al already implemented Amshur technology in the single phase metering chips, which are already released a few months back, and we wanted to test it in the real world conditions. So, this is the uh, map which you see on the left side. This is the uh, Nebul district in northeast uh, Tunisia. 
where uh, tampering is uh, much more than the rest of the country. Um, so STEG installed uh, 50 Amsure enabled meters um, in Nebul district, and they uh, installed these meters as the secondary meters. What it means is uh, that they, they used uh, the Amsure enabled meters uh, in series with the primary meters. So these meters were the non-billing meters. And STEG's goal was also to see that, you know, leave it to those customer locations, real customer locations, uh, which in their list are already tampering. They were having some idea about that. And they thought that, you know, maybe uh, if there are two meters, uh, you know, primary and secondary both, they may not tamper for a few weeks, but eventually their confidence will come back and they will tamper that. Uh, but that didn't happen actually. When the people saw there are the two meters, they didn't do that. So then the other method was to test is, is that STEG decided that they will go with the proactive tampering. And the proactive tampering in the real uh, way, right? That's the real Tunisian way that some of the electricity thieves do it for the tampering. So this is the picture from the field. What you see here, um, uh, the meter on the left is already tampered. And in the middle, uh, the gentleman is trying to tamper with all that safety. So this is a STEG field guy doing tampering. And on the right side, it's the without the tamper. So what was the outcome? So this field trial was uh, mainly uh, divided into two phases, which will go almost for a year. And like the first phase was for the two months. And in these two months, uh, we were very pleased to see that, you know, 83% of the supported tampers, I'm sure was able to detect it. Our goal for the phase one was actually to detect only 70%. Uh, but this is where the Amsure exceeded our expectations as well, and as well as for these tax expectations. Uh, the other thing is on the right hand side, which you see the pie chart, uh, there are the different kind of the tampers which Amsure has detected, uh, which are the common tampers again in Tunisia, which do, and you know, many other countries, these kind of tampers are very common. And so one of the highlight is the double bypass tamper, which is one of the t most difficult tamper to detect uh, today. So which I'm sure was able to detect it not only uh, to tell you that this is this is the double bypass and also uh, like they do it in a different way different sizes of the cable which uh, they tested in that way as well so what is for the phase two for the phase two our goal is to detect 90 percent of the supported tampers and that also includes like you know they're going to do not only tampers which are listed here but some other kinds of the tampers which are common in in tunisia and also, like what I mentioned about the double bypass, not with the same size of the cable, but using the different kind of the cables and the length of the cables. Also, the last but not the least, uh, accuracy monitoring is also very important for STAG. And the reason behind is they, they, they say that when they are going for this new deployment, it's not like that they will they have to replace the meter when it becomes inaccurate. So they want to they don't want to do the proactive replacement. They want to do it when the meter tells them, hey, I'm inaccurate, so please replace me now. The other piece is also that uh, with this new smart metering deployment, <coughs> these regulatory bodies are expected to announce for the sample testing, which is, again, like a big cost for any utility. For that sample testing, whether it's eight years or 10 years, <coughs> so STEG has to go to the field, bring that meter back, and test it. This is what they wanted to avoid and see that if they can fit in with these rec regulatory requirements of the sample testing and avoid that. Okay. So this is the uh, you know project leader of STAG uh, and who was leading the Amsher field trial and this is what he has to say about it. So I'll give you a few seconds to read about it and if it makes sense to you. Yeah, okay, so, and then, you know, if you want to see the real life status of the Amsure enabled meters, you know, the meters which are installed in Tunisia and other parts of the world, please visit us at Hall B, stand BA50, and we'll be happy to show you uh, these meters live. Seeing is believing, so. With the, all that, you know, I open this for the questions. Yeah, thanks a lot for this uh, great presentation. Maybe as a, as a first statement to what you said, um, as a person working a lot with the households and the people behind the meters, I can definitely confirm that there are concerns about the accuracy of meters. Um, and I think that if you have a solid solution to that, then I better look for stocks of your company. Um, so do we have a question for the colleagues? Yes.
concerned with that. Yeah, I, I have a question. Um, so most of the meters that are going into uh, homes today are under very strict regulatory constraints with respect to their accuracy. And before they get deployed, most meter manufacturers have to go through grueling exercises to prove to the various re regulators and to the utilities themselves that they meet these stringent accuracy requirements. So you're adding an extra level here of assurance with this technology. So my question to you is what happens if your technology over time gets in conflict with what the regula regulators are requiring from the meters and who wins? That's question number one. Question number two is, are you doing anything with gas meters? So the second one is much more simple. So I can say we are not doing anything at this moment with the gas meters, but who knows for the future, right? And the I'm sure is a concept which can be implemented into the other technologies as well as a concept. Uh, your first question was that, uh, that uh, these meter manufacturers are already testing it for the accuracy, so how reliable or you know, why we need this secondary thing, right? So one of the thing is that, which is, you know, all meter makers are great meter makers, you know, trust me, I'm not saying, uh, but one thing which is not proven that with the, uh, because of the aging, we all have the aging impact. And we have seen that, you know, these sensors have the aging impact and it start losing uh, accuracy over the time. And that's why the utilities, uh, the regulatory body also came out that after eight years, you have to test these kind of, uh, go for the sample testing. And that involves a lot of cost. But if regulatory also comes out with these kind of a, uh, you know, which allows that remote accuracy monitoring is fine, that it'll, it will save a lot of cost to them. So it brings additional confidence to the utility. And I don't want to name, but you know, some of the universities has done research and they found that meters on the field uh, were inaccurate last year that research was published. And now whenever these kind of things comes out, research comes out, it's get published, news comes out, and you start losing the trust of the customer. And whatever the utilities I have spoken so far, they said that the most important thing for them is the trust. So accuracy monitoring is the additional tool to, for them to uh, give a confidence to their customer that yes, your meter is accurate. And just one more technical point. The uh, features that we're adding to the meter in our chip, as well as some of the firmware that resides in the MCU of the meter, does not impact the legal metrology. So um, it, do it, it doesn't affect uh, regulatory um, requirements at that point. OK, so one short question, please. Thank you. So um, I have one question. Uh, it is clear that this is an innovative approach while getting the information directly from the sensor. So uh, my question uh, regarding the uh, classic analytics tool, which can generate false positive for detecting the, uh, the, the theft and uh, the problems with, uh, with customers. So could any additional system information, it could be billing or non-billing information, can help and enhance the accuracy of the analytics that ADI provides? Thank you. It's oh, a good question. Um, absolutely. So in this initial field trial, we're just detecting tampers and also um, detecting the tamper types. But in the future, what we're going to be looking at is um, estimating the amount of electricity theft that we associated with each tamper because we think that'll be important for the utilities to prioritize you know, which investigations to go after. So the additional data we might need there would be, let's say, the energy consumption. And with the energy consumption data, the data that's collected by the um, MSHORE diagnostics capability and possibly some other um, data coming from the meter, we can deliver a more um, uh, valuable solution for the utilities with the analytics. Thanks. Okay, I've seen a lot more hands uh, have been raised for questions, but as we're having the coffee break now, I would ask you to use that for approaching our speakers. So again, I want to thank all the speakers, in particular for their excellent discipline within uh, sticking within the time frame. Uh, I hope to see you back in half an hour when the coffee break is over, where we get um, real some very, very interesting presentations that, uh, from European research endeavors that actually are, 
I would say, currently defining the state of the art um, of our digitalization in the energy system. So thanks a lot, and see you back soon at 11.30. Thank you. So welcome back from the coffee break. Please put your headphones on again so that you will hear our speakers and that they will be able to hear you when you've got questions to them. So our next colleague um, is, is coming from uh, the Portuguese distribution system operator. And he's going to talk about the Integrid project this time from a different perspective than our talk this morning from uh, Ricardo. Um, and I can really say that being involved in a lot of this European research endeavors that the Integrid project is one of these lighthouses that we currently have ongoing to make our power grids smarter and develop and identify opportunities how this smartness can be exploited in viable business solutions. So let me start your presentation. And here we go. Okay, I don't know. Can you hear me? Yes? So, um, good morning, everybody. Hello. Hello. <laughs> so, my, my name is Pedro. I'm uh, from EDP Distribution, so the Portuguese DSO. And I happen to coordinate this uh, integrated project, which is an Horizon 2020 project. And today, the focus will be more on the customer uh, engagement part of the project. So, the project. Um, so on the, this grid market hub solution that we are developing in the project, that it will uh, enable uh, consumers to take a more active role um, on the energy markets. Okay, so Integrid. Uh, Integrid is, as I was saying, an Horizon 2020 project uh, coordinated by ourselves with 15 million euros of budget. And it runs from January uh, 2017 till June 2020. So this means that we are somewhere halfway through the project now. And we have done the fancy PowerPoint part, and now we are starting to do the more demanding uh, live part of the project. So starting to engage consumers in the process and uh, buying equipments and uh, trying to install them in the consumer's houses and setting up the solutions that we have been developing uh, so far. So we are 14 partners from eight different member states of Europe. And we want uh, the original idea of the project um, was to integrate these five different pillars. So consumers, grids, renewable energy, interoperable solutions, and interconnect all these stakeholders with the motto bridging the gap between utilities and consumers. This is the bridge besides uh, our office, by the way. It's, uh, probably you already saw it. It was used also, I think, in an uh, Apple uh, iPhone X launch or something like that. <laughs> OK, so the, the project has two major objectives. One of them is to demonstrate how DSOs can enable these different, uh, you can see anything. So DSOs can enable these different stakeholders um, to actively participate in the market, in the energy market, and how can they develop new business models on top of um, what we are developing as a framework. So this, uh, this grid market hub that I'm going to show you more. The second one, the second major objective is to test and validate um, these solutions in an integrated way, ensuring that the DSO also reaps a part of the benefits, namely to plan and operate the networks by using this flexibility coming from the consumers. Of course, ensuring stability, security, and uh, being efficient in terms of, uh, of money, so economically. We have uh, three demo sites in three different countries. So one in Sweden with a focus uh, on consumer engagement strategies, uh, which will be replicated on the other two sites. Then in Slovenia, a solution is more on the industrial consumer side, so uh, technical virtual power plants, TVPPs, in uh, Electro Ljubljana, in Ljubljana. And then in Portugal, we are building on our uh, already um, let's say, a legacy of smart grids. For the past 10 years, they've been developing that. And uh, new solutions from smart grids that we are taking uh, and bringing uh, to, the, to the production stage um, of operation. So topics like consumer engagement, flexibility, integration of uh, EVs and storage is also something that we have been doing in projects, in, let's say, in a separated way. And the idea of this project is to bring everything together under the same umbrella and we look at it in an integrated perspective here. So to make sure that the thing will work as a whole. So um, one of the things we are doing is, as I was saying before, sharing um, 
concepts, ideas, experiences from these different demo sites. So uh, there's the, having a consumer at the center, our idea here is this is not a research and innovation project, it's a demonstration project, so we are not inventing anything. We are doing, let's say, the harder part of putting things to work, really to work. So basically there are already some concepts, some, some, some already some uh, solutions are working in different countries and we want to replicate this across different contexts to see how it works and how will be how robust the solutions will be across the different contexts in Europe so we are learning from uh, we have this um, this framework we could be a leader of a, a solution validation we could be a listener or can be a learner meaning that we can be very actively leading the project we can listen to what the others are doing or we can just be learning uh, what they are doing here to integrate in our in our project in our demo sites so uh, in this first year, we developed uh, 12 use cases from four uh, major four domains. So basically grid operations for four use cases here, mostly DSO oriented and connected to grid management, so medium voltage and low voltage. Some of the things you already probably saw uh, this morning in, in Ricardo's presentation. Uh, also the grid market hub, which I'll focus a bit more. So uh, this is probably the most innovative part of this in terms of concept. Uh, then the grid user. So users of the grid also have use cases dedicated to them, either on the industrial side and on the residential side. And then these energy services, which mostly um, are connected to retailers and aggregators and all these kind of uh, entities and ASCOs. And then on top of all these use cases, we have um, come up with a framework to develop business models on top of that. So as you can see here, so on the grid operation, of course, the business models relate to the DSO. On the grid and market hub, it's sometimes not very clear nowadays, but uh, data service providers are the ones that will be majorly impacted. Then on the grid users are the consumer and on the energy service, the retailers and the aggregators. So the grid market hub, uh, this is probably not very easy slide, especially to show like this, but um, uh, I'm sure they can get the presentation and then study with more care. But the idea here is that uh, we as DSOs, our role is evolving throughout uh, the energy transition and we have identified some new roles. This is a process that's already started in a previous European project, you might have heard of it, Evolve DSO, which will run until 2016, I think, so it's finished two years ago. And we have come up with some of the new roles of the DSO. What we have done now in Integrid was to group some of these new roles and not so new roles under this grid market and hub, dom grid market hub domain. So you, you see here the blue, the blue uh, little man. So uh, that interface between the DSO, well, let's say more core systems and the outside world from market side, TSOs, consumers, market players, no? uh, so producers, BRPs, retailers, industrial consumers, I so all that, you name it, so a lot of different actors that are not directly, um, they, they are not con in, inside the scope of the, of the DSO. And also the TSO is also an important part of this. So part of the services that could be provided, namely this ancillary service you see there on the top left side, could also be provided through this grid market hub uh, solution to the TSO. It just happens that we don't have a TSO in the project, so this is something that we are uh, working on, but probably we'll have to uh, test it with more uh, detail on a uh, next project, on the next pilot. Okay, so um, the idea here is for the DSO to actively and neutrally facilitate the market. This means that there are some activities that are inside the regulated domain. Uh, so planning, operations of grids, so high voltage, medium voltage, low voltage is our core business on the left side of the picture under the blue uh, rectangle. Then on the right side, uh, you see here the grid market hub. You see also the TSO because it's also a regulated uh, domain entity. And we will have a lot of interfaces that will allow us to exchange uh, information in this case. Um, and also um, to make sure that the market will, f will work. So this non-regulated domain here on the top, uh, on the bottom uh, right side of the slide could be wholesale market, retail markets, energy market, future market, whoever, you name it, it could be anybody. Our idea here is that we, sh we know that we need to have information from what's happening in the market so that we can guarantee that there won't be any issues on the grid. So we need to make sure that the, the market will work and flow. And this is the concept of what we were calling we are neutral to this, we don't want to interfere in, in any way with the market, but we actively want to facilitate the market by providing this information change framework where everybody can know what they need to operate in the market. Of course, as a DSO, we also might be interested, and that was objective number two of the project, of buying in this market flexibility for our, our own uh, utilization, for our own uh, projects, for our own grid operation um, purposes, especially in case of an emergency or something like that, or some kind of uh, anticipated congestions through forecasting tools that you also heard about. So in this, this idea, enabling non-regulated services, wholesale and retail, 
and also to bring him on board consumer engagement and gamification and energy efficiency strategies that could also arise from, from uh, making available this data to market providers that could be none of these that are here in the energy sector, but they could be doing something with the data that is interesting for the consumer. And this is great. Okay, so uh, democratizing data, this is one of the ideas and these new services. So on the first layer, the grid market have basic services are something like the register a consumer or an aggregator or somebody that could be a register here and have an authentication with, uh, of course, data privacy issues, uh, cyber security. Before, in my back, there's my colleague talking about cyber security. So he's also uh, always uh, aware of these topics. And then I, as a consumer, can choose to download my own data and do something with it myself or I can share and uh, choose to share my data with somebody else, or some third party that can provide service for me. And this must be authorized by myself, but then the third party can do um, whatever. And this will take us to the next layer, which are the advanced services. And these have two, uh, two components, business to business, B2B services, traffic lights, so where uh, congestions of the grids must be uh, visible to whoever wants to use them to ensure that everybody's aware of what's happening and that we can somehow manage the situation, not to go into uh, let's say complicated situations. Uh, also flexibility change to support grid operation. This is what I was talking about before. So DSO using the flexibility for its own purpose. And then, for example, consumption profiles for service enhancements. You can give your, or consumers can give information to third parties, or third parties, better said, can ask for authorization to ac access information from different consumers. And based on that, they can build services uh, to improve and uh, to enhance these consumption profiles and then sell these services to somebody else, including uh, the DSO, of course. On the business to consumer, B2C side, uh, something very basic like giving feedback to consumers about contracted power. Let me make here a parenthesis to say that. For example, in some countries, in which Portugal is the case, we pay all, not only energy, but also contracted power. So the max amount of energy that you can consume instantly. So in this means that when you buy your house, it's already something preset, and most people don't care about that. So it could happen that many times, uh, the, the amount of contracted power that you have is not adjusted to your needs. And this is something that you pay every month, and you can, by getting this information, to really adjust and make sure that you are becoming more efficient in terms of contracted power, or usage of power. Uh, also, another interesting uh, functionality here for consumers are alarms about uh, abno uh, abnormal uh, consumption patterns or high consumption patterns. If they are too low, probably people won't care too much. This is more if you are outside your house, if you are doing um, something that is very strange in terms of electricity consumption, so you get some kind of alert saying it's very strange what you are your consumption has changed a lot. Is it some reason for that? Are you consuming too much and you are not at home? somebody else uh, sleeping over or something, so you have to, information to find out what uh, you could do about this. And the third aspect here, uh, residential energy resources sizing. So I'm a prosumer, or I want to be a prosumer, I want to buy a storage equipment, I want to have PV panels in my rooftop. So how much, how large should these resources be? So is this something that is just for my own usage and I'm fine with that? Or do I want to also to provide some services to the grid and sell excess energy or and, and store part of it? And I would like to know, depending on the place of the grid where I am in terms of uh, facility, this will uh, substantially change. So this is good information for somebody that wants to uh, become more active in this in this uh, uh, energy participation in participation in this energy and energy market. So this is also an interesting feature from the grid market hub. There are more. These are some of the ones that we are working now, but I'm sure uh, a lot will come later. So we were even um, uh, challenging some startups to tell them. So we have this. We have this data. So what can you do with this? So and this was one of the reasons also you, you were in Lisbon a few, in June, I guess. And we had an event there with startups and we will keep on doing it to understand better and new innovative service that can uh, arise. So actually there's now running the Web Summit in Lisbon. You might be aware of that. So there's a lot of uh, activity there. And I'm sure many of them are thinking about how can they uh, disrupt the energy market. And, uh, and also this could be a, a good help for them to leverage on top of this. Okay, and, then, and I was talking about, I'm talking about Industrial consumers and residential consumers. This is not only residential, of course. Uh, industrial consumers consume much more energy. But on the other hand, normally they are much more, let's say, smart in terms of consumption. So they have people dedicated to study the, the processes, the energy consumption. And here, uh, we need to understand very well the processes so that we can optimize uh, some of this. But I'm sure these guys have a lot of flexibility. As you also saw from uh, Ricardo's slide this morning, so the water company, the wastewater company, 
they are in the process of working out their own flexibility so that after that they know very well their own processes and what is the power that they have available at all times and then they can uh, provide them to the grid so that we can uh, uh, use them for our own purpose and they get some, something out of it. Also on the, on the smart home side, a part of what we are doing and uh, let's say a difficult part of what we are doing is engaging consumers. So this is a very difficult uh, part of the, of the project. This is the phase that we are now. So we are walking around the, the demo sites, talking with municipalities, with major stakeholders from the different uh, uh, demo sites, different cities. And it's very difficult to, so to explain to people and to make them want to be part of this. Even if we are, uh, let's say, offering PV panels or storage devices or something that people are very skeptical about this. It's like, okay, <laughs> there are no free lunches, what do you want? Uh, in, re in, in return and sometimes it's not very easy to teach to teach them to tell them that what we want is their flexibility for uh, for in this case for demonstration purposes in the uh, near future probably for grid operation or for something else so we are aiming to have 500 plus houses the good news is that we're not starting from scratch we already had some demo sites with some uh, installations uh, working from previous projects and we our experience shows that on these locations it's much much easier to get people on board because they have been discussing this for two years or something so for them it's not it's not new to give you an exam uh, a practical example we had we had a session in a village with 500 people and i would say like 600 people showed up because everybody already knows what's going on and they want really to participate they saw their neighbors already have some solutions for energy, some storage devices, some thermal uh, thermal load uh, for, uh, for for water heating, uh, thermal loads, uh, PV panels. So this is something already ongoing. In other locations where we want to have 100 people, five showed up or something, and probably none of them was eligible. So we have to work probably more on these uh, locations and try to find the right strategy to engage different consumers. And this is something uh, that is a very uh, key aspect to this project. Another uh, one thing that we're trying to do, uh, based on the work done by our colleagues from, from Sweden, from KTH, is this local uh, and SIM, this, uh, let's say, local live social network, uh, which is something like a Facebook for communities, where we want to put inside of that energy things, energy related things. Somebody already called it low cost demand response, because we really don't need any kind of equipment, we just need to throw information to these people saying, there's a lot of wind tomorrow, it would be a nice time to consume. So if you want to do it, you do it. If you don't want, you don't do it. Or, or the other way around. There's no wind tomorrow. There's no rain. So we are burning coal like hell. So please, if you can, refrain from consuming energy and it will help to be, make the planet greener. And this, this kind of what we have called environmental signals might also be interesting uh, for, for, for shifting demands and trying to make people adjust a bit their demand to the, to the generation. So this is the, the, what I was talking about. In Sweden, they have already this uh, ongoing. We are replicating it to Portugal. So we're doing the Portuguese version of this. And then we are, let's say, uh, doing uh, educational marketing on these locations, teaching people how to use this. We must not forget that many of these people, they don't have smartphones. They don't use internet. So it's, it's much more difficult to, to make them engage. But I, I believe that after they start to learn and to understand the process, they, they really um, become part of this. So coming to the end, so the idea here is really to uh, allow and build this framework that will allow the participants to become active in this sector. And in the end of the day, try to help people to answer uh, people, meaning consumers, uh, ESCOs, retailers, aggregators, DSOs, TSOs, the Energy Commission. So I had this uh, brief, uh, session yesterday with the European Commission on the EU uh, hub. So, and uh, this is the discussion. So how can we support consumers on this energy transition? So when, how do these people know? If they should buy energy now to sell, the, the, should I need a storage, PV panel, the, I have an EV, should I charge it or not? So can I, how can I support all this is uh, probably the, 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 reason why, uh, the, uh, the reason why we are trying to foster this, um, this framework of this project. So quoting here the clean energy um, for all Europeans, first step is to, to put the consumers in the center, is to give them better information about their energy consumption, their costs. And this is something that uh, I hope we are contributing to do. So and that's it from my side. So I need to put this now and take your questions. Thank you. Thank you, Pedro. It was a great presentation. You've already turned it on? Yeah. Perfect. So um, yeah, I think we can all agree on that flexibility is one of the big challenges. And, and so I'm very happy that you were kind enough to, to give us a presentation today about your endeavors. Uh, do we have a question from the audience for Pedro? Yes, please. Hi, Pedro. Thanks. Um, on the consumer engagement side, 
uh, I was curious if there was a problem getting uh, data sharing or uh, people allowing you to share their data with something like a hub um, as opposed to directly with an energy provider since a hub has allows access for multiple different actors and might be seen as something that's less private or if you had <coughs> encountered issues with that at all. Well, so far, no, so far. But uh, as I said, we are still not in the operational phase stage, yeah? So uh, what the conversation we're having, the workshops we're doing with consumers so far, this question, I mean, of course, everybody's concerned with our GDPR and all that and private data privacy, but as long as I can benefit from allowing somebody to get my data into something, I mean, it's a bit like we see in Facebooks and Googles and all that. Yeah? You have 150 pages PDF, do you agree or go elsewhere? So we are not at this stage yet in the energy, but somehow we want to take a similar approach. So if you want to become part of this green market hub, if you want to have these services, guys, you need your data to do something, because otherwise it won't work. Yeah? Okay, perfect. Thanks a lot, Pedro. Okay, thank it was you. really a great presentation. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, as our next speaker, I'm very happy uh, to announce Professor Piero Fatinali from Milan. And he will give us a, a presentation about three um, European research endeavors that are... Um, this one? Yes, this one. So, this thanks for your presentation. Okay, yeah. is this on? I will report. My name is Piero Fraternali. I come from uh, an academic institution, but I've been working on customer engagement for the utilities for the last uh, seven years. And I will report uh, about what is probably the largest and longest exercise in trying to, let's say, transform uh, consumption data into something interesting to the people in Europe. So the idea is something that we have already, let's say, heard about in the preceding uh, talk. That is, we are uh, grabbing a lot of data from people and they have little knowledge about uh, what we are doing and uh, they receive a bill twice a year maybe and that's all they know about their consumption data. The idea is how to turn the, these data into something that f first of all makes sense to the people that at the end uh, of the day are the real owner of those data. It may help maybe also conservation uh, or better uh, exploitation of public goods such as water and energy. And this is also, as many of us keep repeating and hearing in places like this, an enormous business opportunities for uh, utilities and retailers because uh, with the open market, they need to keep and retain their customers in new ways that are not so different from uh, the marketing, uh, let's say, uh, strategies and tools that are enacted by companies that are, uh, let's say, uh, closer uh, to their uh, consumers than uh, utility companies traditionally are. So, what we have we been doing in these last seven years? Essentially always the same thing. So, we take data from uh, people's houses and uh, we use them to do essentially two things and I will speak uh, more about uh, one of the two uh, things that you see here. On one side, we try to transform them into something tangible for people that they can make sense of. At the other side, we try to extract uh, knowledge uh, with data analytics uh, procedures that the utilities can use in order to better uh, operate uh, their uh, business. Uh, as we had already several talks on uh, data analytics, I will not indulge too much on the second aspect. And I will tell you something more about how to try to use uh, consumer data as an engagement tool, maybe reporting more about the failures that we encountered in these years rather than the successes. There are plenty of presentations that say that it's so cute and cool to use these things you know, to retain, engage, or whatever, and that gamification is uh, a panacea and solves all the marketing problems that you may have. Well. Our experience was a bit uh, maybe different from what you read in official reports on this kind of exercise. If you try to observe for a long period how consumers uh, are engaged or are not engaged, maybe the reality is a little bit different. The first thing that comes as a surprise is that IoT is not there actually in the same let's say, way that you may uh, understand from an IoT solution vendor. If you try 
to set up a high frequency smart metering infrastructure that uh, high frequency means less than one day. It's still quite troublesome. The quality of data is still something that you have to cope with. Blackouts or let's say faulty data are common. If you go beyond uh, the daily frequency, these that uh, should be a boilerplate architecture is still something that utility companies, for example, in all the projects that we had needed to implement from scratch, nobody was really already uh, running, operating a high frequency metering network in none of the countries and companies where we uh, made our, let's say, experiments. And so if you try to make sense out of faulty data, you uh, build a faulty sense and you discourage people rather than engage them. So data quality as in, in input is a very, let's say, uh, crucial uh, requirements. If you get good data at the end, uh, let's say, of a painful uh, exercise of uh, infrastructure optimization, what you can do with that? We, you can visualize it. That's something uh, that people tend to consider as uh, granted, to keep, to take for granted. But uh, an interesting anecdote that we encountered in this period is that we went to a company in Cyprus, and Cyprus is a very dry island, and they have a severe I'm uh, talking about, uh, let's say, use cases that cut across water, uh, energy, gas, because we did exercises in all those sectors. And in Cyprus, water uh, scarcity, scarcity is a serious problem because uh, they almost uh, more than double the population in, during the touristic season with respect to the normal population that they have uh, in winter. And they made a little a low technology exercise. They put a consumption histogram uh, on the paper bill. Uh, the last four uh, trimester of your consumption plotted as an Instagram. This simple mean reduced consumption by 10%. They were very much surprised about this, but the fact that people were seeing whether their consumption was increasing or decreasing made them more aware of uh, their behavior. And uh, at the end of the day, they experienced 10% less water consumption uh, overall uh, throughout uh, their uh, customer base. Then you can use uh, data in order to better uh, to educate people to consume uh, not less but better, and uh, to trick people into let's say giving you attention. There are a few techniques from uh, behavioral economics and environmental psychology that are behind the gamification effort that you can try to use in order to get some attention from your consumers. So the first, these are screens from real applications that have been deployed to several thousand families across Europe, and they're very simple. Uh, and some of them are really boilerplate. The consumption histogram is something that you may find all nowadays also in uh, mass market, uh, let's say, uh, products such as Opower, for example. And it's simply the idea of visualizing to people uh, their uh, daily consumption, showing them their average, and maybe comparing them with uh, the consumption of similar users, which is always something that uh, really triggers the attention and uh, starts uh, engagement. So in uh, one project, for example, we asked people to give us their zip code and uh, we simply compare their consumption to the average of their neighborhood uh, inferred by the same uh, zip code. Another interesting aspect is that visualization is important and not all visualizations are equal. People uh, participate for various reasons. Some of them for uh, sparing money. If they consume less, they spend less. But uh, a very powerful engagement factor is instead, uh, let's say, proactivity towards uh, better uh, resource conservation, uh, pro-environment attitudes. So the idea of visualizing the same uh, data in different ways uh, hits the soft spot of consumers, which is not always the same. Uh, the, last, the first visualization is CO2 equivalent. The second is money. The third one is just, OK, we are playing a game. You are good at that, and you are saving energy or water. And so that's uh, your, let's say, current score in a, a gamification exercise. Uh, and this is also very surprising, I guess, have some anecdote. If you play gamification, you need really to have a good uh, legal department in your company because you will get spammed immediately. Another, uh, let's say, simple tool is giving people objectives. 
they tend to do something if they see an outcome at the end of a period. And uh, a very simple thing is, okay, let's state together that you will save this month 10% of water consumption or energy consumption and uh, give them a trigger, for example, a notification per week. Hey, you're consuming too much this uh, week. You will not get to the uh, objective that you have planned for this. Uh, this is a powerful, uh, let's say, thing. It's very simple, but keep people's tension uh, up and uh, promotes uh, uh, engagement and, and proactivity. Another thing that is very simple, if you tell people that they should behave differently, you don't have to give for granted that they know how to do it. So you should teach them or educate them towards better, uh, let's say, better behaviors. And so a simple thing is collecting tips, recommendations, whatever, uh, educational videos. What we are doing uh, for the good of, let's say, the community of researchers is collecting a lot of these small things uh, in, the, in the order of thousands and we will publish them in the public, uh, in the open, uh, let's say, domain for other projects not to reinvent the wheel uh, every time. So we, are, uh, col we have collected 500 small tips on how to consume less water, for example, and we are collecting several hundred small tips on how to consume better energy. And uh, in the application, you can send people recommendations and they can tell you, oh, this is not for me or uh, I will do it or whatever. It's a trust exercise. They will tell they do it. You can only monitor if they have implemented a recommendation from the feedback that you get from the real consumption. Last, we have done an exercise with gamification that goes well beyond the current status of the practice, not only in the utility industry, but also in many, let's say, consumer-oriented uh, businesses, in the sense that uh, we try to pair gamification, that is the usual thing of uh, recording people activity logs and rewarding them uh, with badges, points, or whatever, with real games, with real gaming, that is the most well-known uh, behavioral change tool ever. It has been invented 10,000 uh, years ago, and it worked a lot, and people do engage with these things. And so we uh, made a little exercise also to understand how gaming actually can affect families' behavior. The games are targeted to kids that are the real decision makers in families. So the gamification exercise is a very common uh, one. It's a very boilerplate thing. Uh, we uh, monitor people's action. If you read a tip, 10 points. If you watch a video, 10 points. If you log in, five, you can imagine. And we transform consumption reduction into points again. And so everything that you do in the system is monitored and gives you points. And then you get badges, uh, virtual rewards that are just acknowledgement that you have done something useful. Uh, either for you or for the whole community. For example, you invited a friend to join or things like that. Normal, very common. But not so common in the utility sector. Not very many companies are really implementing these things for their real customer basis. And we have done this for uh, several th uh, thousands households across Europe with some also strange results. Well, I, I will spoil the, uh, the, the... The strangest result that we get is that you always get spam. No matter what the price at the end of the exercise is, because we had uh, in some exercise real prices. At the end of the six months period, you would get an iPad. And we got spam at the very same day that we announced it. Spamming means there is a guy, for example, that is, we have some uh, 60 tips. And he has implemented a script. And he's keeping touching the screen at the super fast frequency. <laughs> he's reading a sort of five tips per second. And he's always r ranking high in the charts, and uh, we cannot alter the rule because for legal requirement, when you launch an exercise, you cannot alter the rule. So he's continually winning and winning and winning, even if there is no price. Uh, the other thing that we are experimenting with is instead, uh, let's say, using kids as ambassadors of uh, the sustainability message. And uh, we engineers restrained from designing games. If you uh, see an engineering an engineer designing a game just go away because the game will be uh, super boring another uh, uh, reflection that I bring to the audience is that uh, if you try nowadays uh, to build uh, a, a digital game and you are not uh, Ubisoft or uh, a Los Angeles firm with billion dollar budget well don't do it 
uh, millennials are used to very high quality games and uh, if you deploy your game in uh, any Play Store it will not go uh, it will not become a roaring success. It will completely go unnoticed. So our idea is very simple. There is one thing that the millennials really do appreciate and if you look at the trends of board games they are rocketing high so if you want to make money don't, and you have not a big budget don't implement a digital game build a board game. This costs uh, 5,000 uh, euros for a European uh, scale distribution. Uh, it's very cheap and it's incredibly attractive to millennials. And uh, we have uh, deployed more than 2,000 copies of this. Uh, you have a video, but I don't want to spoil you too much. And they, these kids are not used to board games, or card games. They're used to clicking on things and they get mad about this. They play for hours. And so our idea was this. This is a very trivial game, it's a very old, uh, by the way, it has been uh, designed by a professional uh, firm, not by an engineer. It's a blackjack game. Blackjack is one of the most. Uh, so the idea is that you distribute cards and uh, then kids have to, I have only two hands, I will try to manage. So they have uh, to draw cards, they bet how many cards they will draw before getting a monster. The idea is that good cards reflect uh, water conservation behavior and the monster is doing the things the other way around so when you uh, he tries to do something he, he instead wastes energy or and uh, it's blackjack so and uh, the idea that we had is that uh, if you want to get the, the connection to close the loop and, and to connect uh, the real world experience also to the digital experience it's possible many real world uh, board game producer are pairing their uh, board game with an app and so we made an app and so you can scan the QR code uh, I will not scan it now not to waste time but you scan this and you get one of those 500 questions on water conservation or energy so at the end of the day the kids are delighted to play a real game they get a little bit of education because all the cards uh, portray an energy or water saving action so you can read the booklet they don't read it but uh, if you want uh, to win the game, you have to turn the monster into a positive card to gain points. And if you want to do that, you have to scan the card and to engage in a trivia quiz on energy or water. So, very simple tools, pretty effective. In, uh, in the, not in this Christmas, but in the next Christmas, you will be able to buy an entire line of educational games on energy and water conservation in, in uh, European shops. The company that is uh, the author of these games is uh, closing a distribution agreement with an European distributor. Because there is business on this. Not only on, uh, let's say, educational games, but on board games uh, in general. I will skip the part on, uh, let's say, data analytics because I think the message here is that you get garbage in, you will uh, emit garbage. If you get good data in input, you will be able to make good prediction. And I will conclude with this, which is pretty, pretty uh, nice. Uh, this is the water conservation results that we uh, have been able to de deliver in Valencia. That is a, a very, let's say, large city. We have almost one million inhabitants. We reach 80,000 families. So the recall rate is 1%. If you want 1,000 uh, uh, consumer engaged, you have to deliver uh, 100,000 emails. 1% is the average retainment rate that we had. On the sample of families that participated to this exercise, 800 out of 80,000 that we contacted, we got 20% of water uh, consumption reduction, which is good. But the interesting thing is that when we stopped the project, because uh, we had no more money to get along, the company decided to continue monitoring. And after two years, the variation of the behavior is still there. So the effect is durable. Uh, they are still not 20%, but the consumption reduction is still happening. And so at the end of the day, the bottom line is that consumer engagement is more than a buzzword. If you want to go seriously into that, there are some uh, cautions that you should take, but it may really shift behavior. Myself, after uh, this experience, I never uh, got a bad tube, uh, but only showers, because now I know that the shower is one-tenth of the energy and the water consumption of a uh, bath. 
and I see on myself the effect of uh, these uh, very simple uh, behavioral change tools. And I think that's uh, the message that I want to convey. Thank you, Pierre, for that great presentation. I think seeing all that opportunities for gaming is, is really a, a great thing. Um, so I'm sure that the audience might have questions to Piero right away. Um, if not at that point, then I would ask all our speakers to, to come on the stage and um, maybe the one or the other has a question for them. I know that some of them have to, to leave early, like uh, Mihai, so maybe if there is a question that you want to uh, ask about the dangerous world of cybersecurity, um, then this would be the right uh, point in time to um, to ask me high about that on the reliability of systems um, on the things we have to fear about is there any question that you want to address at this point okay so we all feel safe no one doesn't Hello, my name is Marcin. I would like to have a question regarding gaming. Um, do you have any experience with uh, kind of advertising part of the games, which will be the second um, channel of the communication with the customers? What do you mean if we advertise at games so with the usual uh, advertising channels that real game developers uh, use? No, no, I mean that uh, inside of the game. We no, 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 no. So no, it's pure, it's pure. Uh, it's, uh, the business model is uh, for the utility companies to use that to fund, uh, a, for example, white label version of the game as, let's say, a retainment uh, widget to their uh, consumers. For the game uh, um, firm, they deliver real games through shops, uh, coffees, and schools. And so they don't use typically the same uh, revenue channels than digital game uh, use. Uh -huh. Okay, so then I'm wondering if we will, um, of the game provider could release the games for free. Is there any chance to, let's say, have the same engagement and uh, the revenue with another channel? The, the, the way in which the, the game can be customized passes through the digital extension. So the typical. Uh, let's say, hook uh, for, uh, let's say, for example, the utility company is uh, to personalize the content of the recommendations, which is a sort of uh, collateral uh, yeah. advertising. And so, for example, in Valencia, the utility company provided us with uh, local knowledge uh, uh, quizzes, for example. Something about, do you know the history of the water that you are drinking from your tap? And, and so they managed to deliver the image of the company through a way that is not properly advertisement. It is intermediate between education and advertising. Okay, great, thank you. Thank you. Please. Uh, thank you very much for the old presentations. Uh, all the presentations were really fruitful and, uh, and good. Uh, I just want to ask you general questions and uh, who feels safe to answer that question is more than welcome. Uh, as far as I see from all presentations that uh, we are uh, collecting uh, many data, I mean, I mean uh, the many data, the, the electricity consumption, let, let's talk about that. Uh, but on the uh, household uh, side of it, as far as I see, the data is most used for the create awareness for the energy savings. But uh, what is the next step? I mean, uh, what are we going to do with this data? Uh, how we can interpret it? I mean, uh, as far as I see that most of some of the companies are using this data for, for the automation, like uh, turning on, turning off the refrigerator or the air conditioner, etc. But uh, this would be the next step, but after that, what, what should we expect for that? So, any one of you feels comfortable to answer that question? Oh, I can give you an example from the water section, but I don't want to monopolize. <coughs> the part of the presentation that I skipped, for example, being able to cluster your consumers into categories and predict uh, their reaction to a water shock is something that is already current. They use data, they have, uh, uh, let's say, 28 different profiles of consumers, both in that, and when there is a water shortage or they have to reconfigure, to redistrictualize, for example, the network, they use that in order to make better simulation models of their demand. Uh, Pedro, maybe, yeah. yeah. Um, just to add, so you were saying that mostly is for energy savings, the data. But that will depend a bit on who you are. So if you are a consumer, of course, what you want to do is to save energy, meaning reduce the cost. 
not necessarily save energy, but most of the time try to reduce the cost. But uh, what we are trying to do, and what we are already doing, is that this data is not only consumption data for own usage of the consumer. So for example, if I want to buy, uh, keeping on the consumer perspective, if I want to buy this PV panel or this storage equipment, it's useful for me to have much more information, which is probably not something that I'm going to do in my own Excel spreadsheet, and I'll need somebody else to, to give this service or to provide me this service. So this same data, interpreted by some other company that has much more experience and probably has more data than me, only myself, so it can collect data or has data from different uh, uh, consumers, e either from the same location or from somewhere else, so the experience is from uh, somewhere else. This data together could be used to build this service for the consumer. From the utility perspective, um, as something I tried to show in my presentation, the idea is to try to use this flexibility. And as a consumer, probably I don't care too much about that as long as it doesn't disrupt my normal life, let's say. So if, for example, if I have a, a service as a utility that will allow me to uh, activate flexibility on the grid that will solve my problem, but this activation comes from very f uh, small pieces of flexibility from thousands of consumers, it doesn't have an impact on the each one individually, but it has a major impact on the grid. And this uh, analysis of this data together here, I think is uh, where a lot of value can be created. So Ricardo, I think you also have an answer to that or an opinion. Yes, um, I think we'll have these data markets in the future. So as a consumer, you will be able to sell your data. So one thing that GDPR brings is that it protects your data, but you can sell it at a price. Um, for example, the Copenhagen municipality, they already have a data marketplace where they actually sell data and you can actually sell your own data there. So I think you, the future will be uh, markets where you share some data, you get some benefit, it can be money or it can be additional services for free, uh, like we have Google is already doing that. So data market is probably the, the next generation of these data driven models. Maybe just to complement uh, what has been um, already mentioned, uh, with regards to data for the utility uh, side, I would say mainly electricity distribution system operators and transmission system operators, which we are uh, engaged with and representing in, in Brussels uh, as an association. Um, big data, it's something which, uh, which is coming more and more prominent, and I think the, the management of uh, the huge volume of data uh, will, will, will be uh, a challenge to be faced in the coming uh, uh, period. Um, I have in mind an example of a project which is dealing with cross-border management of uh, both uh, renewables, uh, integration and storage with a huge data being collected from eight transmission system operators in the southeastern part of, uh, of uh, Europe, from Greece uh, up to Romania and, uh, and uh, neighboring countries, um, uh, working on uh, simulation of this huge volume of data to uh, um, highlight the two, the two critical uh, and relevant aspects, the renewables, knowing that the, the, the ambitious targets uh, already communicated by the European Commission uh, recently and part of the energy package, uh, meaning 32% of renewables by 2030. Uh, that's, that's the new target uh, we are facing. And on the other hand, the uh, compensation, the, 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 the complementarity role uh, played by the uh, storage devices also cross-border uh, approach. That's, that's something uh, which will really um, um, revitalize the, the, the data uh, um, structuring and data management, uh, again, cross-border uh, um, uh, in, 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 several, uh, in several countries in, uh, in Europe. Yeah. Yeah, um, thank you. Um, so along with uh, what the question asker said, you mentioned automation, um, which is obviously a big thing that people are looking at uh, using all of this wealth of data for. Um, so that's, that's actually a really deep rabbit hole once you jump down it. Um, it's, uh, and a lot of these things like smart thermostats, smart homes, uh, smart management of home storage and um, production of solar, for instance, uh, a lot of that stuff is, is still being developed and there's a lot of research that needs to go into it. 
Um, and then there's also services that can be offered to the consumer down the line. For instance, um, people are looking at uh, detection of problems in energy consumption. So maybe if your refrigerator breaks or it's getting old or something, uh, down the line, uh, when we're able to process all of this data and we have really good detection al algorithms, we may be able to actually see that the refrigerator is broken and send somebody a message on a device like PCAP and tell them, hey, your refrigerator might be messed up. Um, it's no longer energy efficient. Uh, you should take a look at that and then you know, maybe give them recommendations for buying options and things like that. So I think there are actually a lot of service opportunities that come out of these data. Um, also, as, a, as an academic researcher, I have to say we love data, so we're very excited that there's data coming out and we have a whole wealth of ideas in terms of uh, analyzing the sociology uh, behind this data, uh, the economics of it, um, and, and so uh, I think that that, that can be a, a real positive for society as well. Okay, it's good to get five different perspectives on, on the same question, basically. Uh, do we have another question that you want to address to the panel? So maybe I may add one of the things that we will going to be to, to exploit that kind of data. And smart meters are actually no more metering volumes alone, but they are also giving us an information uh, about the peak loads one produces. And as we know that the costs for the grid are basically driven not by the volumes that it transports, but by the peaks that we observe, um, I'm pretty sure that uh, in a short period of time, regulators will jump on that and use smart meter data to develop completely new forms of regulating the power grid. So I'm pretty sure that in the future, you're not going to be charged for the volumes of electricity that you consume, but for the peaks that you're producing. Um, and while this may sound very fair, um, actually there can be um, patterns of consumption where this becomes a pretty costly thing for you as a household customer. Um, when you're charged for peak loads and have a very specific habit um, of consuming electricity, maybe not accumulating at a specific time of the day. So do we have any other questions for the panel? Otherwise, I would say thank you again to the speakers. I've had a number of great presentations. It was really very interesting for me and I hope also for you. Um, and if you still have some questions you would want to discuss bilateral, I think they would be happy to answer those now um, where we end the session. So thanks again from my side. Uh, looking forward to meet you maybe later today here around again. Thank you.